The beginning of anything is always a threshold moment. The word threshold derives from olden times and referred to the dedicated space at the edge of the village where the grain was threshed. As such, it represents the zone between the village and the wild world, between what is known and what holds mystery. It befits a book about the dark that we pause and dwell briefly in the liminal space between the day and the night to make conscious our stepping over of a threshold. This positions us appropriately to be fully present to the gifts that the night time will bring if we are fully attentive to the experience. This place we have many names for. Dusk, gloaming, cockshut, grosping, crow time, owl lute, and that very charming Devon word, dimpsy. No other phase of the day or night has inspired more terminology in the English language than this twilight zone and the bit that follows it, the dusk the betwixt and between of the story world, when night traditionally ushered in the fear and trepidation of known and unknown threats. Not surprising, it dominated our attention and imagination with so many expressive idioms. Irish Gaelic, for example, has four terms just to chart the successive phases from late afternoon to nightfall. In Britain, we anticipate a richer way of wildlife at this time, like being at a junction or crossroads with plenty of traffic abroad, returning to burrow or nest, to take refuge from the nighttime threats or emerging to take advantage of what the night has to offer. On this threshold, our consciousness can relax into the tranquility that often accompanies the twilight, and simultaneously our awareness heightens, attuned to what might be lurking in that twilight. It's this special moment, like that brief period when the tide turns, when an influx of new possibilities combines with the outbreath of the day ending. As Antoine de Saint-Exupéry says in Flight to Paris, when words fade and things come alive, when the destructive analysis of day is done. Time, therefore, that's ripe for sitting in reflection and contemplation of the day that is gone, as well as a moment for attunement to what is to come. Um. Winging it as usual. <laughs> Thanks for winging it yourselves. Showing up to what might be a little unknown uh, Earth Talk. My name's Chris Salisbury. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk a little bit about one of my favourite subjects, the darkness and the night time. Uh, what I wrote about in this book <coughs> over there. Um, so a little context is always helpful. Um, the timing of this is... Um, a little bit of the fruiting body of a short course taking place at Schumacher College this week called Into the Night, an immersive experiential inquiry into all things to do with the night and the dark. So um, that's what we've been up to this week, in the woods and in the fields and in the dark. Um, and I've been running these sorts of courses for a long time, mostly through Wildwise, which is a local nature connection organisation offering events and training. I hope you've heard of it, um, but if you haven't, then uh, definitely look us up. Um, and um, I guess the trail, <clears throat> something about the trail that you know led me into these dark places and into this romancing of the night. Because let me tell you, as a boy, I was utterly terrified of the dark. I mean, who isn't? If, if you've got an imagination, you would be, right, as a kid? checked all sorts of things out there and definitely there was always something under the bed wasn't there uh, around behind the door wasn't there um, so you know that was definitely true for me so how on earth did I end up sort of guiding people endlessly you know into the deep dark woods um, well briefly very very briefly I ended up feeding my imagination with a sort of theatre kind of training 
theatre degree, um, like they used to run here back in the day. Um, and then that really uh, took me into a particular form of theatre called theatre and education, working with schools with issue-based theatre, about my passion. My passion back then, my politics, was all about the environment and the natural world. So um, that served me well for a few days, those uh, few years, those theatre skills took me into those sort of classrooms and um, you know, began to get me interested in how to educate. And that role morphed really with an invitation to become education officer for Devon Wildlife Trust. So that was a kind of little quite a bungee jump really into the formal environmental education world um, of a conservation organisation and um, we fairly quickly started um, dreaming up uh, events that would um, bring children, school children onto the nature reserves you know in imaginative ways so these first events that we did immersive events were called wild nights out why the book's called Wild Nights Out, really. These were overnight wildlife camps for school children to come onto a nature reserve and be sort of taken through a series of encounters and immersive experiences with the natural world, including night walks. The most exciting bit, of course, the bit they got most excited when they received their little magical map of the nature reserve um, with all sorts of sort of mysteries contained therein and a kind of beckoning to come and visit so they would come very excited. They were only there for overnight, 18 hours or so. But a night walk um, would take place, of course, and uh, followed by a bit of campfire time. That's where I learned a story, uh, because the kids were saying, has anyone got a ghost story around the campfire? So I learned one, um, and that's another story. But um, I did that for many years, those sorts of things. And then uh, sort of somewhat constrained by the limited amount of time we were getting, having seen transformation in front of my very eyes, um, with that sort of exposure to the natural world and that kind of village type experience, um, just wanted to go further and deeper. So Wildwise was born in 1999. In fact, it was uh, the last day at Devon Wildlife Trust was December the 31st, 1999. It's a good day to end something, isn't it? It's the first official day of Wildwise and the first of January in a whole new century. So that is a, a sort of little, just by way of a little context. And, um, you know, I had to learn my way, really. Uh, contrary to popular, you know, myth, uh, I was not, you know, sort of brought up in the wilderness, suckled by she-wolves, you know. That wasn't my beginning at all. It was all rather ordinary, actually. Fortunately for me, um, my parents, not, I don't think by their design, but fortunately for me, we live near some woods, so I could take myself with my own two legs and go into the, the playground of the forest. So there was a foundation for sure put in place there for me, which I came back to, of course, because I had some good times, often playing by myself, you know, just in my own dream world, fueled by all those imaginative stories, the fairy tales and the um, stories of Robin Hood and all of that. <clears throat> I took that with me and um, yes, yeah, very happy in those places and, um, and then left it all really for a more urban sort of period of time but came back to it um, and yeah, leaned into my kind of love affair with the natural world but with no real knowledge and information but that was quickly came together and so yeah, this is going back of course now that I'm very very old, quite a long long time and I realised that my um, fascination with the dark and the darkness and its constituency um, was a little written about, I guess, and certainly for educators, uh, in terms of environmental educators, there was just very, very little to support you know, that sort of practice to what to do with people in the outdoors at night. So um, you know, I realised after many, 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 many years I had an awful lot you know, if you like, in my portfolio of invitations and, um, you know, experiences. So that's what I wrote about. And being too busy for uh, the next 12 years, um, I never finished the book until lockdown. Which suddenly, goodness me, there was a bit of time, so I managed to get it finished. <laughs> so that is the sort of, a little bit of the provenance, um, you know, of the book. So <coughs> I'm going to... Um, I guess set a few tones that, that are, you know, from the book really, and give you a little bit of a sort of sample 
samples of the you know what the book elvik is offering um and what we when we're on camp when we're on the trail what we're offering in terms of the sort of connective tissue um, and i hope it's going to give you an idea and i also hope that we're going to also just take on a little bit more of a curiosity about the dark um, let me read a short passage now <clears throat> This chapter begins with a quote from Henry David Thoreau. How insupportable would be the days if the night with its dews and darkness did not come to restore the drooping world. In 1880, Joseph Swan's home in the northeast of England, why I, the first to be fitted with this newly invented incandescent electric light, <coughs> enabling continuous bright light and heralding a new dawn for humanity. Sounds grandiose, but it could be said that our world has been profoundly altered ever since. It's quite a moment when that switch was flicked in 1880. In so many ways, the opportunity for continuous light was a boon for us, for humanity. Its advantage, obvious, perhaps, but what's rarely considered was the loss of something very precious. On that night in the compulsively expanding growth culture of the newly industrialised human world, the darkness was symbolically banished, and we became exiled from its mystery, enchantment and psychic grasp. It's not that you can't find darkness at all anymore, but it's now located somewhere other than where most people live. National Geographic quote a 2016 study estimating that 99% of Europe and America are affected by light pollution. So our obsession with brightening our environment ensures that even the dusk is lit now by streetlights burn through till dawn. No string to pull or switch to flick if you want a few hours off to bathe in the quiet enveloping dark, you've got to go out of town to find that sanctuary. And there's a cultural symbolism too, isn't there? turning on these bright lights. The further we get from living with natural rhythms, the more uncomfortable we seem to be with natural darkness. In our language, we've relegated the concept of darkness, you know, nighttime to be negative, reflected in expressions like dark thoughts, or nightmares, the dark side, casting a dark shadow, so on and so forth. Our tendency to tame the darkness has its roots in our primitive survival mechanism. Something seems to have changed in terms of our cultural perception of the dark. I propose the soulful quality of the nighttime has been lost as we've strayed far from the path of living a dynamic, reciprocal exchange with nature that offered our predecessors so much texture and meaning within the rhythm of light and dark. <coughs> in the last bit, in the old rhythm, Dusk was the transition between what went before and the deepening gloom and drop in temperature that necessitated kindling the fire and gathering around it. In that old simple way, the community would reconstitute itself and process the day. Lamplight and firelight would meet with the dark, resolve into shadows with long fingers of soft light, black night, interplaying in movement that replicated an animate, dynamic, mysterious world. Nothing to be done by night. Although that's it, in the pre-industrial era, of course, um, there was that little excursion in the night, wasn't there? Because the uh, formula for a good night's sleep wasn't eight, eight hours, or a straight eight, as I like to say. Uh, it was two sleeps, wasn't it? So actually, people were popping up in the middle of the night, for half an hour, an hour or so, getting on with something by candlelight, <coughs> and going back to sleep. So the night actually was broken, in that sense. It's actually a more modern um, uh, uh, process now that we're in with a kind of expectation of just one go at it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what's on? <coughs> well, <coughs> we'll start with a question tonight. Let's see, we might get to a little riddle. There should definitely be a poem. 
I will attempt a ballad, although I'm following that kind of sweet angel singing is going to be, you know, a good challenge for me. Um, I like to get you to sing as well, and I hope this time for a little story. Does that sound all right? Yeah. Well, question one, the question really, the $64,000 question. Put your hand up. Who's afraid of the dark? Yeah, quite right. I mean, <clears throat> there's a lot, you know, in that question. And there's a lot in our relationship with the dark. And um, how about you spend a minute <coughs> talking to the person next to you? Um, and then they'll tell you a story. See if you can dredge up a story that comes out of, you know, sort of the title is your relationship to the night time and the dark. There might be an event, there might be an accident, there might be an incident in the night, there might just be an atmosphere or nothing at all. I don't know. But let's just have a little check-in with ourselves now, just a minute or two each, and I'll... Um, I'll call your attention back in a couple of minutes. A little chat. You in the night. You in the night. <laughs> Sorry about that, because um, you're in the flow, and I bet you've got a lot to say. So we're just going to go around one at a time and share some stories. No, we're not. We don't have time, but I hope you're going to take these, continue that conversation afterwards. Um, 
things that usually lead somewhere interesting. Um, you know, when I was a boy, um, we lived in a very, you know, sort of normal house and did normal things. It was all rather ordinary. Um, so when I was, I can't remember how old, but quite young, <coughs> you know, we'd spend the evenings, this would have been in the 90, early 1970s, watching television, you know, colour television. But then it came to um, go to bed. My parents would send me off to bed. So what I had to do then is deal with the dark in my house. You know, just one story to n navigate. But I was so confronted. When I came out of the living room, I just quietly entertained myself in front of the mirror, making faces as long as I could to entertain myself before I could hear my parents coming when I knew I'd be in trouble. That would give me the impetus to run up those stairs to get away without being seen. But honestly, I could, an hour could go by a while for the distance. Yeah. <laughs> Did that in the mirror. Um, and then, of course, there was the bathroom mirror, so I had to take myself a bit longer. But really, I was just trying to avoid the terrors of the dark. And for me, they were... Um, particularly, it was witches, actually. I can't remember what the inspiration was, you know, or the terrors were, came from, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, funny, isn't it? And yet, yeah, it's also entirely normal afraid of the dark I mean we're biologically predisposed actually to fear what we can't see is a sight dominated species um, more of that in a moment here's another question though or maybe it's almost a riddle because why is it dark I mean it sounds like a simple question mm -hmm. but why is it dark okay so I know you're all thinking the same thing. What are you? What's the answer to that question? The obvious answer? Because there's no light. The Earth turns. What else is going on? Sun is hidden. Sun is hidden. So that should be the answers, right? <coughs> turns out that's not the right answer. That's not the right answer. This is why it's a bit of a riddle, but it's actually science. Now, if you've read my book, you'll know the answer. So I don't give the answer if you've read the book, because a riddle, really, you should just enjoy everyone else squirming, and listening to those cogs going. Well, if it's not the sun going down, then why is it dark? That's not why it's dark. I mean, it's true, there is no light. But why isn't there light? Because there is light. Because there is light. No. <laughs> yeah. It's a conundrum. And they only figured it out a couple hundred years ago. Um, <clears throat> in a kind of astrophysicist way. He figured something out that was a true answer to that question. Why is it dark? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer, am I? It's in the book. Can you explain why it's a conundrum? Because it's very difficult to figure it out, unless you're an astrophysicist. But, but we have figured it out. Well, we think we've figured it out. I know, but that's not the right answer. Oh. It's really not. There's a, a very extraordinary other answer. Um, well, if I get time, I might tell you. Let's see how we go. Um, so, yeah, we're... we're you know, we're hardwired to fear the dark. You know, we're not the top predator. We may feel like it. I don't know if you feel like it when you go to Tesco's. Um, but you know what I mean, in this sort of environment, you know, we're very comfortable. And we're not used to that, you know, feeling of, of just, yeah, being on the menu for some other creature with bigger teeth and long claws. So that's hardwired in our kind of whole uh, psyche. Um, our cellular memories, you know, refer back to a time when we were not top dog and if you've been to any of those places that still have those apex predators um, you'll know just how humbling it is and enlivening to walk in the wild places knowing that there are creatures who might you know leap out and get you and of course at night where our dominant sense is not so active um, we have you know we are absolutely programmed and our biology will, you know, do its very best. Our night eyes, it turns out, are much better than we think. 
if they're given time to acclimatise to the diminishing light. Um, you know, when we've got these bright lights, you know, we go outside and encounter the dark, uh, of course, you know, it's not so effective. It takes 40 minutes or so for it to all kind of acclimatise. And it's those rod cells on the outside of your eyes, your irises there, which are the active ones. These are the ones that are active by day two, particularly with movement. So they catch movement like this and they see in a whole colour spectrum that's sort of greys and whites and blacks at night. You don't see the colour at night. So they're active. Your pupils widen to take in all the sort of photons, the availability of light. So it's not like you know you you're, you're clueless at night at all. Um, but it's a it's a very rewarding thing to do is to walk without a torch at night and just actually try out your night eyes because uh, they're better than you think. But clearly we're not going to see as well as a tawny owl. Um, you know, these senses of ours are not so well adapted in their, you know, specific, um, each sort of virtue of each sense. You know, we can always find a better competitor, you know, in the animal kingdom or the bird kingdom. Um, but, you know, we use what we have. And of course, at night we use a lot our ears because generally we'll hear things before we see them. You know, any obscured view, <coughs> you will generally hear wildlife in the daytime rather than and see it to begin with, for example. So, you know, we're biologically attuned to um, the threats uh, of the night time. So that's just in the wiring and it's not surprising. We've got other kind of cultural kind of layers on top of that, haven't we? You know, we may well feel safer in the wilder places in Britain than we do in the urban spaces, of course. Um, but it turns out that Research, you know, and data tells us that there's much more crime in street lit areas than non street lit areas, for example. So, you know, there's a safety and a sanctuary in the dark, too. <clears throat> and that's very much what we're exploring this week on the course. It's just finding that refuge and inspiration and enchantment in the dark. So, obvious to say, but we are, you know, uh, in bodies that actually haven't changed for. You know, 100,000 years in their design concept. So in fact we're born with all the capacities of our hunter-gatherer uh, ancestors to make the most of you know, the, uh, the world we live in. So um, sometimes that's reassuring to hear and to remember, oh actually we're not that different culturally, of course we are. Um, <clears throat> I would say that that, um, you know, that familiarity and literacy, you know, came for me over many, many times, which isn't to say I didn't frighten myself, you know, if I found myself in the woods at night sometimes, that imagination of mine, you know, but it was a literacy thing, really. The more and more time and contact time I had, the more familiar I was, um, the more I settled, and the more I began to find out about the extraordinary things that go on at night. Who knew? All sorts of, you know, creatures, you know, emerge, Let's think about the, um, <clears throat> what would be the nocturnal soundscape in Britain. If we're thinking about the more than human, the natural world, you'd be hearing what sort of things? Night jars. Night jars. Night jars. In Devon we still hear night jars. Um, not many people hear a night jar anymore, that continuous, monotonous, churring sound, and you find them on the heaths, these mysterious birds that in Devon they used to call goat suckers, because they would arrive in May from southern Africa, they'd flap around in sort of slightly weird ways, um, and, uh, uh, you know, hoover up all the moths and things at night. And they believed that these mysterious birds were responsible for stealing the uh, milk from the udders of the goats. Um, and then off they go back to Africa in August. But a night jar is a marvellous thing. And of course it was much more prevalent when we had more heath. Um, but they do like clear fell, so the forestry, when it gets cleared, you might get night jars moving in. What else do you hear at night? Owls. Owls. Many different types of owl. Well, a few, only in Britain. Um, but the most common owl, <coughs> the one that is characterised in the cartoons, the one that does the tawit, to woo that one. You know that one? The tawny owl, yeah. The only owl, actually, owl that, that hoots. But the tawit, to woo is the tawit is the contact call from the female. Yeet, yeet, that kind of sound. And then to woo, the male territorial calling, hooting sound. So a really familiar, familiar soundtrack. And the owl is um, perceived 
not everywhere, certainly not in Africa, um, where they really see the owl as a, as a threat, as a portent of death, actually, in a lot of Africa. Um, but cross-culturally, in many other parts of the world, they see the owl as very wise. And this, presumably, because it sees what we do not see, and therefore it must have wisdom. It um, navigates in extraordinary ways with those eyes, which are slightly different shape, longer, and they are round, and those discs, facial discs, you know, tiny little sensitive hairs to feel their way. They see a remarkable amount of, you know, light in the dark when we can't see our own hand in front of our faces. In fact, it's not that it's true dark. That's pretty rare to find. There's always a few photons floating about, and the owl's eyes can uh, definitely take advantage of that. And then they take off with their, <clears throat> you know, wings, and their wings are silent. And they just move silently like ghosts through the night, supremely adapted and hearing with their differential ears, one higher up on one side of the head, one lower down, and that gives them a grid reference accuracy on some small level. And tawny owls are often heard, of course, barn owls not so much. Someone this week was saying they'd seen one recently just around here, which is delightful to hear. Um, <coughs> Short-eared owls, long-eared owls, little owls, and well, you might even find the occasional eagle owl. Apparently there's one or two abroad now, which is a very big owl, um, and is European-based. And of course there is the snowy, occasionally. Might visit somewhere like Orkney. Anyway, I'm digressing really. Um, there's too much to talk about in the night, but that's some of the soundtrack. What else might you hear at night? Nightingale. You might hear a nightingale, but sadly no longer in Devon. The nearest place you'll have to go is Somerset's. So that's declining, and if you've been lucky enough to sort of, you know, get to one of Sam Lee's delightful concerts where he pipes in real nightingales from Sussex, you'll know what we're missing, you know. Um, but yeah, anything else? Anything of? Hedgehogs! Saw one the other night on the trail in the North Woods, snuffling around, yeah, what else? Foxes, yeah, different kind of calls, different sounds. The foxes, it's a terrifying sound, the vixen screaming, particularly at mating time at the end of the year. If you didn't know what it was and you were out in the woods on your own, you'd be terrified. It sounds like someone being murdered. Um, <clears throat> that's right. More things would be badgers with their wide, wide vocabulary. They make all sorts of noises, badgers, but social animals often have a very wide vocabulary. They have uh, deer in the rut. You ever heard red deer rutting or fallow deer? Uh, there's a lot more wild boar around these days, um, spreading along the south coast of England. And yeah, and we could go on. Lots and lots of sort of mysteries of the night to acquaint oneself with. And at night, in fact, on the, on the trail to get close to wildlife, it's, it's a great time to get close to animals as it happens. So that's what we did. Um, endless trails, calling the owls, watching the badgers, um, we didn't hear the bats very much, unless we had a bat detector, and then we could hear them. Um, and then back to the campfire, back to the um, you know blazing campfire to settle in for um, for that atmosphere. I mean, you know, without the night, can you imagine? Well, that would be uh, an impoverished culture that couldn't sit around the fire like we used to do. I mean, in the old days, there wasn't a light to switch, you know, to flick on the heating, to flick on the lighting. Um, and go into your separate houses. You know, 99.9% .9 of our human history, someone kindled a fire when the sun went down and the fire was the warmth, the fire was the, you know, the, uh, the light at night. And of course, that circle around the fire <coughs> and then to begin to process the stories of the day which of course is what we do at Wildwise all the time and endlessly gathering around the fire and spinning those yarns but then right then perhaps in the old days when the stories of the day had been composted and processed and argued over and who said what to who perhaps by the light of a rising moon or under the emerging light of the star confection of stars maybe a shadowy figure would stumble out of the dark and take their seat, the seat where they always sat at the fireside, and those people from the village would lean in to hear a bit of old story. Um, and that's how it was, you know. And the beauty of it was that there was no, there was little contrast, you know, it was all softened, wasn't it? You think of these bright lights and their edges and their kind of fierceness, there was this other quality to the night of firelight, which is very soft. You know, and the shadows and um, 
it's a different vibe, it's a different ambiance. So we're in a different state, we're a different uh, animals really at night. I mean, clearly there's some, some processes going on where the, you know, the neuron sensors in the eye, you know, send messages to the pineal gland. The pineal gland then starts to produce melatonin. Melatonin starts to get into the blood and the blood vessels are dilated and the temperature cools and that's a cue for feeling tired. You know, all of those natural processes are going on and for a mental state, of course, it begins to shift our way of thinking. Um, and at night in the fire, not so much to be done, but lots to maybe reflect on. So there's that very lovely contemplative quality about the night too, which we miss when we just flick on the light switch and continue the day's activities unabated. Um, so something to sort of, I guess, reflect on there. And but yes, <clears throat> endless ghost stories to begin with, because that's one of the most accessible forms of traditional narratives still in the culture today. And we're coming up, aren't we? We're coming up to that time of the year and suddenly it's the flavour of the month, ghost stories and Halloween and celebrating that wonderful time of year when they say, well, they used to say, the veil between worlds is thin and can even be drawn aside if you want to make visits to the other side. And of course, those from the other side, the ghouls and ghosties, can make visits to this side, which is why in the old tradition here, um, they recognise at that time of year, that's when stuff would happen, you know, things would be seen, all sorts of nonsense went on. And also the hierarchical kind of um, societies that the Celts used to live with, um, the kind of Druids, they recognised that it was healthy for a culture to have some kind of time off, have some crazy time. And um, that's kind of where the roots of our sort of trick-or-treat sort of traditions are. That psychically, for the psychic health of the culture, then they had to just have a few days of madness. And it also opened up the channel to the ancestors. So there's a great deal of reverence and um, conversation and prayer and time spent with those that had gone before, so a very healthy thing really, um, in terms of its provenance. But it is the season for a ghost story, so uh, I should probably tell you one. You want to hear a story? Yeah. <laughs> Not too scared. Don't worry. Um, I mean, <coughs> when I often, if I'm doing a little ghost story session and, you know, <coughs> on count, Kids will just, you know, enjoy that, and then they'll say, have you got a scarier one? <laughs> and I say, yes, I do, do you want it? And they'll be like, yeah. And of course, there's safety in numbers, isn't there? But when those kids have to go to their tent in the dark, they really regret asking for that story. I mean, I know some pretty nasty, unsettling ones, and I don't plan on telling you any, and I certainly don't tell kids those ones, but... Um, yeah, well, let's have a... <coughs> Let's have a bit of old story that is founded upon, um, you know, anecdotal evidence. It wasn't long ago, um, just a couple of generations really, when all of you, you know, would have been thoroughly invested in all sorts of expressions of the other world, the spirit world, the pixies, the googies, the ghosties, we've got a hundred different names for the secret commonwealth, the other world, the little people, the this, that and the other. Everybody would believe in that sort of thing. It just was taken for granted. Yeah, That other world exists and some people see them a lot and report on seeing them a lot. Now that still happens, doesn't it? Because I bet you know someone who swears they've seen a ghost, but it's someone, not everyone these days. Um, so there's definitely a cultural shift in our perception and I think in our relationship to a more animate world um, and I think the state of being a more imaginal species in those days where there was less information dissemination, a little bit more projection with that imagination. So interesting world to live in, I think. Um, and that was certainly the indigenous mindset to project that kind of imagination, story the world and characterise the world all around them, to live in a very reciprocal, animated world now. Modern day science would perhaps dismiss, you know, the truth of any of that, but I say who cares? What a more interesting world to live in. Um, so this is a story that when I sort of did lots of research into ghost stories and Devon in particular, this one kept coming up. It was, oh, who knows, maybe it's, I mean, it's a funny place, Devon. I don't know what it is about Devon. These ancient 
old rolling hills that give rise to so many stories and anecdotes, testimonials, um, experiences of ghosts, hauntings, happenings, otherworldly visitations. I mean, maybe it's got something to do with the funny folk that live in Devon, I don't know. But you can't deny it, more in Devon, I'd say, than anywhere else. And the thing that shows up more often than anything else is the death coach. Anyone seen the death coach? Mm. Mm. Yeah, seen it over there, very good. <coughs> the death coach, you know, I mean, there's you know, lots of different variations on the theme, but the common themes of the death coach is that it's um, black. It's got... You know, made of a bones. It's got four skulls at the four corners. Sometimes there's a coachman, sometimes he's got a head, sometimes he hasn't. Two horses, usually black, sometimes four horses, occasionally six horses pulling the death coach, usually a black dog trotting about in the vicinity. And it's most often seen between Oakhampton and Tavistock. This is on Dartmoor. And sometimes there's some sort of figure inside that's reported on and this figure inside, they say, is Lady Howarth. Turns out she lived in the 17th century, so she was a real life historical figure in Oakhampton. And, um, well, the opinion is that she uh, accounted for four of her husbands and two of her children. Very nasty piece of work, and it's said that it is her penance to drive nightly between Oakhampton Park and Fitzford. And her penance is to pluck a blade of grass and to convey it to Fitzford and to continue to do so until every blade of grass is plucked or until the world be at an end. Well, those people who purport to have seen the death coach and who were recorded in their sort of, um, you know, oral narratives, seeing the death coach, you know, they would, um, you know, be terrified if they heard that rumble of wheels up on Dartmoor. And they would say, you know, if ever you do hear that rumble of wheels, you just fall to your knees, you know, and you say your prayers out loud, and you just hope that that coach doesn't stop because it's meant only to stop, to pick up the spirits of those who are about to die. Well, I found first of all in an old book a written verse, so I put it to a bit of music, and this is called The Ballad of Lady Howarth. My lady had a sable coach and horses to and for. My lady hath her black bloodhound that runneth on before. My lady's coach hath nodding plumes, the driver hath no head. My lady's face is ashen white as one that is long dead. Now pray step in, my lady said. Now pray step in and ride. I thank thee I'd rather walk than gather to thy side. The wheel go round without a sound or turn or tramp of wheel as cloud at night in pale moonlight along the carriage still I'd rather walk a hundred miles and run by night and day than have that carriage Hold for me and hear my lady say Now pray step in and make 
no ding stepping with me and ride there's room i trow by me for you and all the world beside and all the world beside and all the world beside some medicine in the dark. <laughs> Turns out that very darkness is actually very good for you. I'll just read you a little bit. <clears throat> um. <laughs> Those that take this fear of the dark one stage further, there's a technical term for that, acluophobic. That's the deep fear of darkness. Well, in general, living creatures need periods of activity and rest. The interchange between light and dark help our circadian rhythms. The significant shift away from our long history of living half our lives in darkness must be having an impact research is now evidencing. A deprivation of darkness is indeed taking its toll on our rhythms, moods and well-being. When we understand some basic biology, it's easy to make the case for darkness as a sort of natural medicine. So I was talking about the neuron cells and the melatonin and all of that. Turns out that <laughs> melatonin is also an important anti antioxidant to protect cells from harm as well as a stimulant for our immune system to activate white blood cells at night. There are certain cells in the retina that send a message to the brain to reduce the amount of melatonin released when exposed to blue light. Present where? Yeah, in all of those screens and LEDs. Blue light triggers fight or flight response. Clear to see how this use of blue light and street lamps as well. And those screens and electronic devices is affecting sleep patterns. While we sleep, our bodies work to restore, replenish on themselves. These tasks are compromised when artificial lighting interferes with restful sleep. So there's a sort of, you know, a reason to switch things off and let the light levels fall and let yourself acclimatise to the night for your for your better sleep for your well-being it's all the rage isn't it this conversation about the sleep and the nation is you know in a sleep crisis and everyone's sleep deprived and mm -hmm. these are some of the sort of clues as to perhaps why um, um, perhaps more interesting than just sitting at home in the dark of course would be to take yourself out <coughs> and that's a kind of um utter threshold that is a sort of counter-cultural thing to do, isn't it? To stay, step out of the warmth, step out of the light, and step into the dark. Um, David White is one of my favourite poets and has a poem to sort of invite this consciousness in. And he has written a poem called Sweet Darkness. And it goes like this. When your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision has gone and no part of the world can find you, it's time to go into the dark, where the night has eyes to recognise its own. There you can be sure you are not beyond love. The night will give you a horizon further than you can see. Let the dark be your home tonight. There you must learn one thing. The world was made to be free and give up all other worlds except the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn that anyone or anything that does not bring you alive is too small for you. So that's quite an invitation, isn't it? Really taking ourselves off and uh, attending, not just to the physiology of a good night's sleep, but there's a soul aspect, isn't there, to the night time? That reflective soul is another quality, very different by day. 
and with all its joys and delights by day and diversions and distractions by night, it's a more internal process. And so we just naturally you know, reflect and make contact with some of our interior kind of world. And that's one of the sort of provocations that we're often you know, issuing forth on camp to take on a night walk, take some time to sit, yeah, and just be present with the night and all of its marvellous uh, mysteries. <coughs> So uh, a little endorsement, really, for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, at night they come without being fetched. By day they are lost without being stolen. What are they? Night they come without being fetched. By day they are lost without being stolen. I mean, you can't see the stars by day. And if you're lucky enough, and we are lucky around here, there are places you can go on Dartmoor where it's a pretty good dark sky. Uh, to behold a confection of stars, I often think to myself when I'm under the stars, I'm looking up, apart from the occasional satellite space station that wanders past, looking up, and the view hasn't changed. I mean, my ancient ancestors would be staring up at this pretty well the same view. Wow, what a thought. And I bet you the effect is the same on them too, because you do get that beautiful bit of perspective, don't you? And you just breathe it in, the awe and the wonder, how small we are. Or as someone else was saying this week, God, I feel how big we are too. Um, our sort of place in space. And this illusion of the stars, you know, moving, of course it's us spinning, isn't it? And sometimes we forget that we're on this spinning spaceship hurtling around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour. You know, spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And it looks like everything's just passing over, of course, and it's a great cycle. And, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's a long love affair that we've had you know, with the stars. And it's, I think, one of the guaranteed ways you can facilitate for others you know, an experience of awe and wonder. There's wonderment. That was Einstein's definition of education, by the way. He did define education as the growth of wonderment. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a confection of stars, and if you've been to the desert or you've been out, boat at sea where you've got kind of, you know, those horizons all around you and you've got a moonless night. It's something to behold, isn't it? Um, and it's definitely the furthest you're going to be looking. You think about how our view is obscured, even at the top of the mountain. Don't see that far, but you're seeing a very long way away. So um, it's something to consider just how far those star lights have travelled. I mean, don't you just love all those space facts? I, I didn't have any of this at school. I mean, where was that on the syllabus? Explaining our place in space, and, you know, and, and looking at stars and hearing all those amazing stories about the stars that different cultures have told over, you know, so many generations. Where was that? What I did have was Carl Sagan. Anyone used to watch telly in the 70s? Carl Sagan, bless him just spinning these marvellous narratives about space. So I definitely kindled an interest there. And now, um, you know, uh, on the Star Trek, so I've learned, you know, lots of little star stories and some of those gobsmacking facts. I mean, who knew that the moon was disappearing? Four centimetres a year, it's getting further away. And, um, but right now, in this particular epoch of deep time that we're in, isn't it amazing how the distance of the moon, when it gets between you know, the Earth and the sun, fits exactly, you know, when there's a total eclipse like that. Now, in the years to come, it won't fit exactly. It just does right now. This is one of those exceptions. You know, you've got one of those, um, what do they call them, an um, annual... annual um, eclipses where you can just see a ring around the outside. Uh, it's much more occasional. But anyway, you know, it's just weird. Um, let's throw up a bit of praise about the moon, talking about the moon. 
I mean, the moon, calendar, clock and compass, you know, did so much for us for so, so long in terms of recording the cycles and the rhythms. And, um, you know, it's been an inspiration to cultures all over the world. So, uh, yeah, let's give it a little love. A bizarre kind of birthing, wasn't it? The story of the moon, that big whack theory. I think that's an American that probably coined that term. That collision in space, you know, so it's a piece of Earth that, um, you know, broke off and eventually coalesced with all that debris and is sort of, you know, the gravitational pull is dancing around the Earth. You know, that's, that's a pretty wondrous scientific story, but of course, different cultures have marvellous other stories for the birth of the moon. So, um, there is a song that we could sing to the moon that comes from a culture out west. I don't know the specifics, but I do know that it was a praise song, which of course, you know, these indigenous kind of mindset you know, would understand that you did need to keep fertilising the world with song and with praise, else it would not reciprocate. See? Um, so, uh, you know, praise was just a very sort of almost an everyday kind of um, act of thanksgiving, um, remembering the blessing of being this ridiculous little kind of tiny pinprick in a fast, fast universe, expanding universe, cue Eric Idle. Um, and uh, and uh, here we are with this sort of bubble of life, you know, what a dream. And so I think, you know, indigenous kind of mindset was to be very in touch with that. So here's a song. Um, I'll sing a line, you sing it back. It's really easy. Nisa, Nisa, Nisa. Nisa, Nisa, Nisa. Nisa, Nisa, Nisa. Nisa, Nisa, Nisa. Nisa, Nisa, Nisa.
when the world was made, it was all darkness. It was just darkness, and all types of darkness, all shades of darkness. And out of the darkness, there were creatures. But in those days, it's so long ago, the creatures and the people were the same. And they spoke the same language. And back in those days, they understood that words had power and magic and could be used to cast spells to bring about form and future. Mm -hmm. They knew this. And this particular story begins with an argument that a fox and a hare were having. They were arguing and just using one word, because that's all you need to bring about form and feature. And the fox was using the word darkness because fox loved the cover of dark. Because fox then was able to move about unseen, covered by that blanket of dark, and he could steal from everyone and hunt and find his food. But Hare didn't like that word because for her, the night, the dark, would not enable her to see her predators and not her, enable her to find her food. So she was using the word daylight. And the argument went like this. Daylight, darkness, daylight, darkness. It's like that. Daylight, darkness, daylight, darkness, daylight, darkness, 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 daylight. And it went on like that for quite a while. Just cries ringing out over the hills and the hollows until there did come a time. The old people say that there was a fire, a great burning light rising in the east and the tide of darkness took refuge, scuttled away, scudded away to hang out in shade and shadow. Oh yes. And later that day, in fact very late on in the afternoon, Fox bumped into hair again and straight away they renewed the argument picked up where they left off. Daylight! Darkness! Daylight! Daylight! Darkness! Daylight! Darkness! Until that fire sank over the western horizon and then that tide of darkness swept over the land and it became the rain of my flood. The story goes that ever since that time, and ever since they were having that argument, day and night have alternated ever since. And in fact, fox and hare have also alternated ever since in terms of when they find their food, but if a fox does run into air, he's still cross and he's still a bit grumpy. <laughs> because that time he remembered when hair's word daylight had more potency than his word darkness. So he chases hair. But if it's daylight, hair will always get away. She's much faster than fox. It just continues like that. That's just a little, because that's all we had time for to finish this talk. A little tiny flavour of an Inuit tale. Canadian North. So um, thanks for being here and listening. We're going to just wrap this up a bit with a beautiful song from Holly. It's a sweet bit of punctuation. She's going to sing another of her tender affection to the night. Um, and then I'm going to be over there um, signing some books if anybody wants one or chatting. Um, so Think into this for the last few minutes. Thank you so much for coming. I'm glad you got out, and I'm hoping you'll pause and tarry a little in the night. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to share with you a little bit about this song. This song I wrote spring um, as part of the uh, homecoming event, the homecoming singing with nightingales event that um, Chris was speaking of that Sam Lee runs um, in Sussex and in um, Gloucestershire. I've never heard a nightingale in real life, never, not in the wild, I've heard recordings but never in my life have I actually heard a nightingale and uh, obviously I'd love to, I'm big into the birds. But this is my love song to the nightingales. One day I might get to sing it to the nightingales. Unbutton the gaudy garb of day. Cast away the crumpled cloth. The waiting 
Because of what band wet is a hobbling head. Sizzle light to slice the velvet sky. Stuck up to stitching, seeming itching, shapes a shadowy show. Thank you very much. Thank you.